Hello, good afternoon everyone, and welcome to the high-level event on Together for Transparency. My name is Mariana Castaño Cano, climate communication expert, founder of 10 Billion Solutions, and it is my absolute pleasure to be your moderator for this event, the second high-level event of the Together for Transparency at COP27 series. Today is a very special day. We are almost midday towards the 17th, when we are going to conclude this special series of events about the enhanced transparency framework under the Paris Agreement. We are all actors in making the Paris Agreement work for everybody. We like to say that the enhanced transparency framework is the backbone of the Paris Agreement, what keeps it standing. We must work for transparency, we must keep those who have the power to drive us towards a safe climate future accountable for their actions. And it is my pleasure to present you today an amazing panel of speakers. We have uh, Ovai Sarma, the Deputy Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC, UN Climate Change Secretariat. We have Ms. Rimel Saim, the United Nations Secretary General's um, Chair of the Youth Climate Advisory Panel. We have Raquel Moses, the high-level climate ambassador and CEO of the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator. Bogolo Kenewendo is an Africa director and a special advisor to the high-level climate action champions team. And we also have a representative, the, the, the chief sustainability officer of IKEA, Par Stengmag. And we are going now to hear the vision of the implementation of the Enhanced Transparency Framework from the perspective of the UN Climate Change Secretariat. And Ovel Sarmat is going to be opening remarks. Ovel, please. Thank you very much and a very warm good afternoon to everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to see you all here and welcome again to the UNFCCC Pavilion and to the COP, actually. And uh, here we are, almost about the midpoint of COP. Uh, things are, I think, started very well uh, with the adoption of the agenda and inclusion of loss and damage in the agenda, which is an important thing. And uh, we're progressing, making good progress, but there is still a lot to be done. But this event is about Together for Transparency. And before I go to my remarks that I have been uh, given, let me reflect, as already was mentioned, transparency is the backbone, central, the main engine of the Paris Agreement. And I'd like to thank and appreciate all our colleagues, starting with Don and all the team in transparency who have done amazing work to complete, finalize the transparency framework for, of the Paris Agreement. It's an extremely important aspect, and many colleagues say that it, the work is completed, but I believe it is just started, because once the transparency framework, the enhanced transparency framework, which has now been completed in Glasgow, it now is imperative of, for all aspects of the Paris Agreement implementation, be it Article 6, be it loss and damage, be it mitigation, adaptation, transparency will be what, it, what will hold that together to hold uh, stakeholders to account, to be accountable. So that's the power of transparency, and uh, that applies to all aspects of our lives and livelihoods in many, many parts. As the UN Secretary General has said, we are facing the code red for humanity, and now is the time to act. And as, as we clearly stated, this COP is about implementation, uh, time for words and negotiations is over. We really need to turn those words into action. And once again, transparency would be the way to do it because if, if our actions are, are not transparent, then they lose the credibility and the integrity of the action. And that applies to both the public sector, the governments, the parties, and, the, and especially the non-party stakeholders. And the reporting review and the consideration of climate data and information re referred to as transparency. Without it, as I mentioned, we are left to act blindly. Without the knowledge of our 
circumstances and, and our impact. And that is why transparency is at the very core, as was already repeated, of the Paris Agreement. And it also provides us a snapshot of our progress. And next year will be an important uh, time in the process of UNFCCC, the global stock take. And once again, transparency will be driving that process in many ways because transparency enables the global conversation about where we are making progress and how actions are generating impact or lack of it. And under the Paris Agreement, the new enhanced transparency framework, which is referred to as ETF, has been fully established and completed in terms of the implementation or the start of the implementation. And for the first time in history of climate agreements, all countries now will follow the same reporting and peer review process. And this is a very powerful process in that respect. And ETF is a journey and not a destination. And it recognizes that countries begin their journey from different starting points. And every, every country, every stakeholder will have specific uh, aspects, implications, and conditions that need to be taken into consideration. The best preparation for future is to start now. We have gained significant insights over the past 30 years of building the existing system for measuring, reporting, and verification of climate actions and support under the convention, but now we know where we have to go and where we have to take the process forward. Today I'm here to ask you that we take a step together, together for transparency. Thank you very much, Mariana. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ovais, and uh, we thank you especially because we know how busy your schedule is these days when we are full steam ahead with the negotiations, so we really appreciate you, appreciate you took the time. Thank you very much. And now we are going to proceed with a round table, and we are going to hear from our remarkable panel of speakers about what is it transparency, what does it mean to them and to their organizations, and we are going to analyze what are the benefits of embarking in this journey, as Obeis just mentioned. Does it work? Yes. Excellent. Thank you, Nasmin. Yeah, and I'm going to start with the private sector. Par, you represent IKEA. I mean, who doesn't know IKEA, right? Uh, it is a well-established brand, and uh, it, is, it is a brand which I am sure many people here in this room, we have sometimes bought something at IKEA. I, I, I learned once, I read that IKEA's catalog is actually one of the most published books <laughs> on earth. So you get to every household, almost. So I am sure that you that you are aware of the huge responsibility that uh, your company has. And when it uh, comes to being transparent about the pledges that IKEA uh, is doing since some time now, how do you take it? What is it that transparency means to you and to such a multinational as the one you represent? Yeah, definitely. I um, 
every time I've been to one of, of, of your shops, really I thought about it as a, um, like a cultural center, right? I mean, you, you have such a power to get to people, right? That so many more people get to an IKEA shop than ever walked the climate conference. So I'm happy to hear that, that, that you are invested uh, in, in this outreach also effort. And uh, in kind of a bridge between the private sector and the policy making, Bogolo, you, uh, we, we had the chance to meet in, um, in, in Gabon a, f a few, uh, a couple of months ago, and it was very interesting because that was a meeting with a, pu a public of uh, policy makers, people from ministries that now must implement the enhanced transparency framework from very different starting points, right? Uh, we were there talking to Africans' national uh, focal points. You, you had the, the Africa division for the high-level climate champions. How do you see transparency? What does it mean from, from you and from the, the sector you represent? All right. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for hosting us. Um, so from our perspective, uh, transparency is uh, making good on promises and uh, bringing people together and making sure that climate action is not being uh, uh, reduced to only being about sustainability, but brings in the point of uh, development. And that has uh, proven to be so important, even at ACW when we met, um, you know, there was a very strong push of we need to know what we've committed to, we need to know what has been done, but most importantly, we need to know what we need to do. And I think that uh, change in tone is what's going to add more flavor to the transparency framework. And I say that change in tone because it is a strong recognition of that uh, uh, the transparency framework isn't only about member states, countries, but it recognizes the play of non-state actors, the role of the private sector in uh, delivering on uh, uh, climate action and the implementation of the NDCs. And this has uh, um, actually become so alive uh, now during COP27. We've seen so many um, landmark commitments that are made by African non-state actors, businesses in the insurance industry, the largest 60 businesses in Africa. Uh, we've seen uh, um, even uh, uh, you know others committing to uh, uh, carbon markets and so forth. And it is all recognizing that implementation of NDC and reporting to the progress that has been done in developing countries isn't only for the uh, government, but it is also a responsibility of NSAs. And this is one way that uh, I would explain how the transparency framework or thinking about transparency has really um, uh, amplified and ramped up actions by non-state actors. And I remember something that really stayed with me the last time we met. Uh, it was uh, the reference you made about finance and how important transparency for financial support and transparency on financial support uh, is. And, and I would like to touch upon that just in, in a second after this first round. Raquel, uh, well, we just discussed. It was not exactly the same conversation, but yesterday I had uh, the opportunity uh, to know a little bit of what you are doing from the Caribbean Climate uh, Accelerator, Smart Climate Accelerator. Um, please let us know a little bit more from your perspective, what is it transparency for you? Yeah, for, thank you so much and, and thanks for yesterday as well and thank you all for being here. So for us, transparency really is a carrot, right? It's not, it's not meant to be a stick. It's meant to be, listen, this should be the Olympics of all Olympics, where we are cheering on who's in front and who's leading and who's winning this race, because we need them to win. So for us, transparency is the carrot that will save all of our lives. Transparency allows us to learn from the ones who are doing the best work. So, you know, transparency is a, is a tool, it's an opportunity. And we're doing that now within the region where we're looking at well, listen, Jamaica's figured out how to open up the market and to, to, to do the work when it comes to um, their energy market. Barbados has figured out solar water heaters. Bermuda has figured out um, water security. So let's see who, who is the center of excellence and what are they doing that the rest of us need to learn and just figure out how to just do that over and over and over until we're done. 
And then for, for us, it's hope. You know, it, it's just, it's simple hope. I mean, it's so easy to feel bogged down. And I must tell you, today was not my best day. I was starting to feel like, is this, you know, is this making a difference? But we have to keep going. And I think that transparency helps us to, to continue to, to have a measure that helps us to keep going. And I think it also gives us a language, a language to communicate with people who need to influence the policymakers. You know, it simplifies that language and allows us to have that thing to communicate. So I think it provides for us a lot of carrots and, and we should look at it in that way. Definitely. Thank you for, for that and thank you for your passion, Raquel. Ms. Rin, yesterday I was thinking of you when I was recalling, uh, I was uh, quoting Antonio Guterres. Uh, he said something that made the headlines, which is that we are all driving on the highway towards a climate hell. And in my mind I was thinking, okay, yes, we are on that car and at the back seat there are children, our children telling us, Please, mom, please, dad, stop, right? And, and I, I really had a, a, a thought um, for you and, and for the young people. And it's beautiful to see all this activity at, at the children and, and young people uh, pavilion this year. From your perspective, the group that you represent, Ms. Rin, what is it transparency for you? <laughs> no, I um, yes, so um, I think I, I admire all of the previous speakers and your question too, but with all of the respect, I don't think we should ask about what is transparency. Even a five years old kid know what is transparency. To be transparent, it means to be able to see through, people able to see through you. So we need to be able to see through IKEA Foundation, we need to be able to see, uh, to see through the governments and the local communities, and we, we need to be able to see through the Secretariat and the work that the UNFCCC is doing. I think the actual question is, are we ready to be transparent? This is the main question. No one is ready to be transparent. <laughs> I, I want to share a very personal story. Um, I've been married for a long, almost year, eight years, seven years now. And I remember when I met my husband, he, his only request was to be transparent with him because transparency builds trust between couples. I'm failing since then. <laughs> but this is the actual reality. We are not ready to be transparent for one reason. First of all, the communities that we are living in is extremely judgmental communities. The work that uh, is being done by the private sector, for example, it's either greenwashing or they are doing a good job, but everyone is saying they are doing greenwashing. So they are stigmatized by doing greenwashing, whether if they are, they're actually doing greenwashing or they are not doing greenwashing. So the private sector stopped being transparent. The governments are not transparent because you cannot win voices if you are transparent. And uh, unfortunately, people still like promises, even if they know that this person is not going to actually fulfill this promise. We all know, and since we are kids, they t t taught us that election campaigns is just fancy promises without, but why? Why the campaign should be uh, promises without actually being able to target them? Um, why uh, should we have an opening world leaders where uh, a prime minister of a country commit to be carbon neutral by 2070? And I'm sure he will not be alive at that time, unless, of course, he's a dinosaur or something. But this is the question. Why do we need to be untransparent while we are all in this together? All of us is go are going to distinct if we didn't do this. Not only us, but then our children, our grandchildren are the next generations. So I think the question we need to ask ourselves is not what is transparency. We all know what it is. But why are, not, are we not ready to be transparent? Absolutely. And there was a saying, very 20th century kind of, a French saying that said, well, on election time, promises only engage those who believe it, which is very cynical, and that time is over, right? Because we know very clear that we must be all involved. And I really love what you said about stigmatizing uh, the private sector. I don't know how many companies are here. I don't know how many thousands of representatives uh, are here and I keep say I keep hearing from the outside but what are they doing there are they greenwashing I said maybe some I cannot go and check on every single line of your report right but 
I think there are a lot of well-meaning well -meaning people, but, but you really need to, I think, speak on a language and compare pears to pears. And I think that we are comparing oranges to pears when it comes to uh, corporate um, transparency. I would like to hear from you, Bar. How are you from IKEA trying to communicate transparency in a matter that it is comparable to something. I also think that it's about to dare. I think it's really about to dare and have integrity of what we are doing and also to be open to share successes as well as failures. And I think sharing the failures perhaps is something that we all, I think including us as an individual, can be a little bit more open to as well because that is also that you have been daring to do something. You want to reach out. You want to do some better things. But sometimes things don't go exactly as you want. But that is, I think, a part of being a part of, of, of solution. Because when you try out different things, you will both fail and you will succeed as well. But I think it's such a valid point that you're bringing up here. And it brings inspiration, I think, to all of us to dare to do more. And we might sometimes be caught between a rock and a hard place, as, as you said, about stick and housing and so forth. But we shouldn't be bothered about it, and it shouldn't hinder us to go down the transparency road. So, what it's all about, it's basically about, first of all, to be accountable for the impact we have on the planet. To try to describe it in a standardized way, so, so you know, we have something to hold on to, and uh, using a science-based uh, approach to that is the way forward, because then, of course, we can compare as well. And I think we have reached pretty far already. There are already standards out there that we can utilize, so it's not a hinder already now today. And there are some fine tuning on them, of course, but the, 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 the big foundation is already there. And then it's about accountability for the goal setting, in a sense. To be uh, transparent, but these are the goals that we have set, actually. And accountability, of course, for how we are fulfilling the targets, the goal setting, and the gaps that we are closing. And I'm coming back again to that. It's, to be open and also dare to be vulnerable in terms of the failures and the successes, that is in the long run building trust for all. And I think I really like what I said, it's about seeing through. I really like it. So that we open up. here is how we are. This is what I stand for. This is the genuine company. This is the genuine person. This is the genuine organization. And I think to be genuine, that is so important for the future, to be able to build trust as well. Absolutely, trust, trust, building trust in a system that we definitely need, right, to achieve the Paris Agreement uh, goal. And finance is a huge component. Bogolo and I really would appreciate if you could enlighten us with uh, some insights on how transparency for finance support and transparency on the way we support others can help us achieve those climate goals. All right. Um, first, I want to deal with uh, this issue of uh, that transparency is truly risky business. And um, uh, to the point of it's all about trust, you know, it's very difficult to trust a system uh, that has failed to uh, produce results. And I understand people's uh, trepidation around these because if we, if we take really a hard look uh, many of the very fantastic initiatives we've had have really, we've failed to attain strong uh, results of the targets we've set for ourselves. And I can see why uh, there could be a question of, are we really ready to be transparent? But that said, I think even though it's a risky business and there are all these challenges, we do stand to gain a lot more uh, than uh, lose in being transparent. And now to tag it uh, to your question around uh, finance. Um, the way we are looking at this uh, transparency framework 
is that in reporting and the dialogue that would be associated with it, we can stimulate further climate action, one. And we can enhance uh, public and private sector uh, investment flows because there is a clear indication of where the money is going and especially if the NDCs, as we report back, are associated with investment plans. Then it's able, then everybody who has access to the information is able to identify where the gaps are, where the opportunities are, and be able to plug themselves. And we believe that uh, since climate finance is such a cross-cutting issue, uh, the reporting outputs under uh, this convention may serve as a very key and central point of access for stakeholders, including sectoral ministries, you know, usually when we deal with environment or climate action, it's just the ministries of environment. But we now know that climate action isn't just about the Ministry of Environment. It is Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Planning, and so forth. So once we really start to focus on the implementation of the transparency framework, the disclosure becomes a very key point of development and for access of uh, finance by uh, subnational governments, by the private sector, philanthropists, and all these can truly be dealt with around uh, your GSTs and your uh, SEFs and the biennial uh, assessments. They can be very useful and fruitful. Matter of fact, we have started engaging with the private sector around country platforms. And country platforms are really information that could be disclosed around the enhanced transparency framework, which means that there is value uh, to working around this uh, uh, transparency framework. And if we play our cards right, and if we're truthful, and uh, we're honest about uh, where the gaps are, then we could see more and increased uh, flows, particularly from the, fi uh, uh, from the private finance sector. Now, because I'm an economist and I'm from the trade world, if you may indulge me for a little bit uh, longer, um, to me, this sounds very uh, close to what um, around the WTO is uh, the um, trade facilitation agreement where we disclose what we are able to deal with in terms of a doing business environment and uh, uh, trade facilitation, what we are unable to finance but we recognize as very key, and then what we are willing to partner with other people. And that allowed for really strengthened partnership in trade facilitation. And we see the outcomes. So they have led to uh, uh, facilitation around the AFCFTA amongst others. Thank you very much, and thank you so much, Bolo, for helping us connect the dots, as you always do. Thank you. This is really very uh, interesting. A lot, of, a lot of food for thought for the transparency team here. And now bringing it down to the countries and the different sectors, in the conversation we had yesterday, you were mentioning that we need to talk to people in a language that, rela that it's relatable to them. And uh, we cannot use a, a framework or a narrative that works for Western European countries that will work, or not at all, for a Caribbean country. Could you please let us know more about what transparency means for the countries in the Caribbean, and in particular for the civil society? Thank you. Sure. I really wanted to start with um, the, the, the issue of greenwashing, right? Because I understand that it's important and, and that, you know, everybody's talking about greenwashing. And I loved what you said about personal responsibility and, and how that factors in to transparency. But I'll tell you my challenge with greenwashing. It is us pointing a finger at somebody else and, and almost, you know, calling them out. And, and this, this climate, climate progress has been stymied by, oh, well, you're greenwashing. You know what I like about greenwashing? You know what I love? It means that they care how people see them in this context. I feel like that's the gateway drug. Okay, we've got you greenwashing. You at least care. Let's get you to actually do something now. So, you know, I, I feel like it's, it's less, we need to use these things less as weapons and more as, okay, you clearly have gone through the trouble, so let's pull you in a little bit further. Let's, let's help you to walk through the door. And so I feel like this antagonistic position that we take in this, in this sphere isn't helping us make the progress that we need. And so we need to get to the point where 
it, it's less about me telling you, well, what are you doing? And so, you know, this is what I'm doing. I hope you come along with me and to see, to bring more people along. And that is what, you know, the language, the use of language and how we communicate these things and breaking it down so that it's simple and you can explain it to your grandmother or you can explain it to your four year old and you make climate action be cool. Because right now, when we're talking about gloom and doom and everybody run, I think people are shutting down and we have to find another way to communicate. We have to find another way to engage. We have to find another way to get people excited because the reality of the situation is if we are only talking to each other, we are not solving this problem. We have to find the people. So we need to be going to, forgive me, the Republican National Convention and being like, you know what? I feel like I feel like there's a journey we can be on. You know, finding the spaces where people either have tuned out or don't care and finding that middle ground and just inching closer to them and getting them to inch closer to you until we close the gaps because we will not close the gaps otherwise. We, we have to be deliberate and determined about changing the way that we're approaching it. Otherwise, we will keep circling this issue of how do we get to the goal. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, being uh, vulnerable. I mean, accepting being vulnerable to criticism from the youth, from activists, because we must there, we must care, but we must also there. And now I turn uh, Nisreen to you again. Once a, a, a scientist told me, um, why are you asking me for hope? Why should I give hope to people? When you go to the doctor, do you want the doctor to give you hope or to tell you what you have? so that you can put a remedy onto it. And that resonated on me. And every time I hear the claims from the young people, I really think, yeah, solutions is good, hope is good, but we need reality checks. And, and the reality that the younger generation will face in 50 years from now, yeah, are not ours. So Nisrin, uh, you were very vocal in, <laughs> in your first uh, intervention, and, so, and um, I would like to, to continue that, that route because I, I think we need that, right? What is it that young people can contribute to the enhanced transparency framework, to the overall architecture that makes the Paris Agreement work? I like to pay, play with the questions normally I get asked in the panel. So I will play with your question and ask a question of, what are the windows young people have in order to be able to help enhancing the transparency? We are ready, but are the institutes ready to get our inputs? So what the windows are open, what are the opportunities that we have to actually engage? Because you cannot ask me if I had dinner or lunch when you know that I don't have the ingredients to cook. Yes? So. Uh, if I am ready to give inputs, but no one is ready to listen to my inputs, then what is the question? And then again, I think there's a huge problem and a huge burden that young people are carrying. Why should we enhance the transparency of an issue that we did not create? Yes. Um, I just want to comment on um, a previous point was mentioned there. I, I looked at you, but <laughs> I wanted to jump. Um, to be transparent, and because you mentioned NDCs, I want to do a small game with the audience here, so please engage with us. How many of you actually had a look on their country's NDCs? Looked at the NDCs, your country. Yes, your own country's NDCs. The Secretariat staff, I think, uh, doesn't count. <laughs> okay. How many of, keep your hands open if you had a look on it. If you had a look on the NDCs, keep your hand up. Okay. How many of you participated in making them? Okay, how many of you actually their country implemented their NDCs? Full of it. Half of it. Half of it. Third of it. It's, it's obvious, the gaps are obvious. There is no finance to implement the NDCs. There is no public participation in making the NDCs. And to be very more transparent, we know the gaps, we know the questions, we know the problems. Let's stop pretending that we are in 
point B where we still don't know things and we don't know it so we can solve it. We already know it. Let's move to plan B where uh, point B actually where we talk about the problem and the solution and influence uh, the world leaders, country policymakers to actually implement these solutions. So we know the gaps. We need to solve them now. And that's, that's what this transparency means to me to be honest to ourselves and to the people in front of us. If the NDCs is not working, we come here and say, well, NDCs was a good, nice experience, but it's not working. No country is implementing their NDCs, and every five years we come and meet and say, we failed implementing the NDCs, but we are submitting a new one. For what? For what? So I just think that being transparent means that we say, we failed in this, let's change it and do something else or let's do it better. So either we actually provide finance to implement our NDCs to address the gaps, or we change the idea of the NDCs to something else, maybe go back to Kyoto Protocol. Yeah, definitely, definitely, absolutely. And a lot of this COP is about finance, right? A lot of the trust in the negotiation rooms and the corridors depend on showing up on, on the promises made many, many years ago. Yeah, definitely. And now we must uh, wrap up because I see that nice little dishes are uh, getting ready for a short reception. So, yeah, we're going to do a last round of intervention. Bogolo. Thank you. You know, I think um, sometimes we're, re we're really cautious not to antagonize young people, um, uh, especially when uh, given a platform and we recognize, I started uh, as a young activist and I really do understand the passion uh, that comes with it. But, you know, we, it, it's also our responsibility to shed some more light when you are uh, intricately uh, involved in a system and you can share how some processes go. Um, for example, with the NDCs now, uh, we know that for most countries, the submissions were made by the ministries of environment. And when you look at the national development plans, they will still include water, infrastructure, power, and all the other things that should be in the NDCs. But because these two haven't been speaking to each other, uh, you, they are not reflected in the NDCs. However, some of the implementation that is under the NDPs continue, which I think could have been in reflected by uh, the hands here. Because if you say just according to the NDC, you're leaving a really big part of national development. And this is why earlier I was saying climate action is not a standalone or a reductionist issue. It is definitely, especially in the continent, an issue of development. And it is very crucial, and this is uh, one of the conversations we were having at the Ministers of Environment meeting, uh, that this issue has now gone way outside their purview. And the Ministers of Finance need to be in the room, the Ministers of Planning need to be there, so that there is one uh, concerted effort around a development, a green development agenda in a country. And then I, I believe that it's really crucial uh, that we ensure that there is this understanding. I know that countries are not the same, but usually the process of NDPs starts at, gr at grassroots. But the process of uh, NDCs, the way it happened, was that the ministries of environment by themselves fund uh, these projects. But within this enhanced transparency framework, I believe that there is an opportunity uh, for the division to push for a more holistic way of, uh, 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 of uh, reporting and truly ensure uh, that in, in the review process, we are including just over and above a climate environment agenda, but really focusing on a financing development agenda. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, many questions. This morning, we had a similar session with journalists and, and members of the civil society yesterday. And, and, and they also uh, asked for their chance to contribute to the, to the processes. We have CDP, we have uh, NGOs, environmental, f farmers, everybody. 
and everybody's eager to contribute, but they need to understand, right? And there must be channels for participation. And and now, before we go, I would really like um, to end with a, a positive note, and I would really like to let us know, apart from you, you are Chief Sustainability Office. This officer, this is your uh, bread and butter, but what about the rest of the board, right? At IKEA boardroom. Do they understand? Do they want to be on board? Without a doubt. We have a clear commitment to fulfill the Paris, uh, contribute to fulfilling the Paris Agreement, and we are to fully committed to the 1.5 degree goal. So there is without a doubt. And that in our strategies, embedded in our business decisions, we are fully committed to, to do our part. And as a company, we have a big responsibility. And in this big responsibility, we take the full value chain responsibility and, and bring as much as possible of the scope one, two, three into the accountability that we have. And uh, as a care, we are uh, the product range is our identity, so it's always our responsibility for the products we put on the market and the operations we do in our full supply chain. So, yes, definitely, we are fully committed. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I would like now to turn to you, Nisreen. So what do you expect from the enhanced transparency framework or just, let's call it transparency? Well, um, first of all, I just want to clarify something. I, you said you started as a, uh, as a young person. I started as a child 10 years ago. It's been 10 years and 10 months since I started doing climate change. This is my eighth COP. I attended eight COP. I negotiated four agenda items for six years in a row. So I'm not here speaking as my capacity as a young person. I'm speaking in my capacity as a professional who actually worked in climate change, helped the young people and their governments to actually do something. And that's why I'm saying that we actually know the gap and it's time to address it. Now back to your question. So we have the global stock take. And I think it, this is an universal, um, international, multilateral um, hope window where everyone can actually participate in that. Yet we have a challenge that we don't have yet a formal way of how the global stock take results will actually feed into the formal process. And I think young people can have a very nice input to that because we don't have something that we worry on. We are not running for presidency, so we don't worry about votes. We don't have companies yet hopefully, so we don't worry about uh, a profit. I think having mechanisms that uh, enable young people, civil society, media, indigenous groups, local governments to actually participate in this global stock take and make it transparent so everyone can know the actual place we are standing is, is a huge opportunity. And this is a call for the Secretariat to make different paths for the global stock take so we can actually have a stock take, not um, um, a show off of the stock take. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you very much for that. Raquel, I would love to hear what are you bringing back home and what are the actionable takeaways that you will bring with you in terms of transparency? Oh, boy. Well, I want to I wanna first start by answering your question and saying that we need, we need more passion, eloquence, ability to reform questions because we need to rethink how we're approaching things. I think we will not get where we're going unless we rethink things. But to say that, have we all in the Caribbean, across the 20 countries that we represent, achieved our NDCs? No. Have we made progress across the 18 countries that we monitor? Yes. Some countries, Jamaica, has achieved its, its first NDC and then resubmitted and upped its, its ante. So it's, I think it's, it's, it's important that we recognize the progress. Otherwise, we will feel hopeless. And I certainly agree that climate finance is an issue, but I think it's a nuanced issue, and that's what I'm hoping to bring back. You know, so, so we're hearing from, the, from the, the, the money people, there's no end of money. We need projects, we need projects. And then we're hearing from the projects, we need money, we need money. Because you're talking about a different kind of money and a different kind of project. And we need to start closing those gaps. But until we have the difficult conversation and ask the question, answer the question that's not been asked, we will not get there. So what I'm taking back is hopefully more linkages, more relationships, more new questions, new answers, and more hope, I hope, you know, that there, there is a path to get there because we will not 
get there unless we believe that, that we can. And I really see this transparency as a, w as a pathway, like a clear beacon of light that will help us to find our way. So that's what I'm hoping for. Thank you. We need that beacon of light in the middle of the clouds <laughs> that are above us uh, in this time. Well, I really sincerely thank you for taking the time and for sharing your passion and your engagement to truly make a, a difference. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Thank you very much to everyone here in the room, to everyone watching us online. And uh, we are about to, to end, but before I would really like to use this minute to invite you to uh, tweet, to post on social media around the hashtag Together for Transparency, to go and check the rest of the schedule. We are not even midway to the end of the Together for Transparency event. There are plenty more coming up, so please stay engaged and talk about it around it. Because conversation and talking is one of the most powerful tools for change that we have. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. Thank you.